Hey there, friends, David Lightbringer here. And you know, as someone whose first truly immersive cinema experience was the opening night of Jurassic Park. Ah, yes. I have to say that season one of House of the Dragon definitely stole my heart with the first trailer showing Nana Vagar's Godzilla foot. There it is. Oh, yes, and uh, Caraxes foot also sends its regards. Now it's time for season two of House of the Dragon, which means some or potentially all of Westeros finding itself under the stomping feet of the dragons and their fiery hot breath as well. If House of the Dragons season one posed the question, just how many dragons can live in one house? Then season two is about to show us that the answer is, well, not quite that many. That's right, there's war afoot and it's a war between dragon riders. So I figured before the fire and blood begins, one of the most fun and important things to do would be to rank the dragons and the dragon riders, how they stack up against one another. This will be a no spoilers video, by the way, so I may use some of my knowledge of what happens in Fire and Blood to inform me about the general ferocity and character of the dragons, but I will not be referring to anything that hasn't happened on the show yet. All right, so we've got three groups of dragons to discuss. We've got the Team Black Dragons, the Team Green Dragons, and then the six unclaimed dragons on Dragonstone, three of which are wild and three of which have had riders before. We'll begin by listing them in groups so that we know who we're ranking. So for Team Black, we've got three mature dragons paired with riders. Melis, the Red Queen, the fastest dragon in all of Westeros, who's ridden by the steely-eyed Princess Rhaenys Targaryen. Caraxes, the Blood Worm, ridden by Daemon Targaryen, who are obviously the most battle-tested of any dragon and rider pairing. And Cyrax, Cyrax wins. Uh, the dragon, not the Mortal Kombat droid, the, the dragon of Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen, whom, whom we've seen Rhaenyra ride into tense situations before. So those three dragon and rider pairings are the primary muscle behind Team Black, but of course there's also Vermax, the dragon of Prince Jaceres, who is definitely of fighting size. And they did have Arax, of course, uh, dragon of Prince Lucerys, but now, you know, Nana Vagar gave them the chomp and they are no more. But there is one other dragon of rideable size, apparently, and that is Moondancer, who is ridden by Bela Targaryen, in the books, Moondancer is regarded as not quite big enough to ride yet, but is very close. And obviously, judging by the season two trailer, it seems like they've chosen to size up Moondancer a bit for the show, and uh, Bela is already riding her. Jace and Luke's younger brother is Joffrey Targaryen, and his Tyraxes is not quite big enough to ride yet. And the same is true of uh, Aegon the Younger, Daemon and Rhaenyra's eldest son. He has a dragon called Stormcloud, not quite big enough to ride yet. And then after that, there's a couple of hatchlings, which may or may not even be on the show. Now, for Team Green, of course, you already know, it starts with Nana, Nana Vagar, who is twice the size of Caraxes and is now paired with Aemond One-Eye, who seems to be cut from the same true Valerian Dragonlord cloth that Daemon is cut from. Aemond and Vagar kind of started the war, officially, with the Chomp, so... Now they're going to have to carry the weight if Team Green wants to be victorious. After Nana, we have uh, Sunfire and Dreamfire, the dragons of the royal couple, King Aegon II and Helena Targaryen. Dreamfire is older and larger, having once belonged to Reyna Targaryen. Dreamfire is actually almost 100. But as I've said before, one does have to wonder if Helena will be willing or capable of flying her dragon into the brutal horror of medieval warfare plus dragons. There's really no such concern about King Aegon, who has shown tendencies towards violence and aggression and lack of impulse control. And then finally we have Tessarion, the dragon of Alicent's third son, Daron. Daron and Tessarion are kind of just chilling in Old Town right now, and we know they'll be part of the show, but we don't know if they'll be here this season or perhaps not until season three, probably more likely. Like Team Black, Team Green in the books has a couple of hatchlings, which may or may not be on the show. So it's really those four rideable dragons against the five for Team Black. And then finally, there are these six, count them, six unclaimed dragons on Dragonstone, three of whom are wild and three of whom are uh, under the care of the dragon keepers because they've been ridden before. So you saw Vermithor, for example, in a certain chamber of Dragonmont where Damon knew where to find him, where to sing to him, presumably they feed him there, etc. 
Now last season, Damon was speaking of trying to find riders for those six dragons, and we don't really know where those riders will come from, as obviously there aren't a bunch of seasoned dragon lords without dragons just sort of chilling, waiting for a dragon. Reyna Targaryen, sister of Bela, is really the only one, and she's like 13. So anyone who would ride these dragons would be inexperienced and potentially even of questionable loyalty if they're outside of the direct families of Team Black. In any case, the three unclaimed dragons who've been ridden before will be much easier to claim again. And those would be the aforementioned Vermithor, the dragon of King Jaehaerys, Silverwing, the dragon of Queen Alysanne, and then Sea Smoke, whom we saw ridden by Laenor Velaryon in Season 1. Obviously, there's the question of what's going to happen with his bond with Laenor since Laenor faked his own death and fled Westeros instead of just dying. Very inconvenient that Laenor and his desire to live and have a happy life and not use his dragon to play the Game of Thrones. I don't know where he got that idea. Maybe he's read the books. In any case, I'll give you my breakdown of how I think that's going to work when we get to the sea smoke section of the power pole. As to the totally wild dragons on Dragonstone, they're going to be tough to bond with. The longer a dragon is without a rider, the harder they are to claim. That's one reason why the Targaryens, Reyna Targaryen in particular, came up with a practice of placing the dragon's eggs in the cradles of the young Targaryen, so the bond could begin even before the dragon hatched. And failing that, you'd want to bond with a young dragon and under the care of the dragon keepers, kind of like we saw the kids doing in season one. So sort of on the other side of the coin, imagine walking up to the smoking lair on the far side of Dragonstone where the cannibal makes its lair and asking for a ride. Yeah, somebody might try to do that. And of course, the cannibal, he is a huge black dragon, the largest of the wild dragons, who is rumored to have lived on Dragonstone since before the arrival of the first Targaryens, which could make him as old as 230 or older. Cannibal is named for his habit of eating young dragons and baby dragons and dragon eggs and such. So that's pretty awful. And then there's Grey Ghost, an elusive and reclusive Grey Dragon who just wants to be left alone to eat fish. And then we have the Mighty Sheep Stealer, fan favorite Sheep Stealer, whom, by the way, is a lot larger and older than you probably think I found while researching this video. And as you might guess, Sheep Stealer just wants to be left alone to steal and eat sheep. I don't mind stealing sheep. From the mouths of dragon seeds. Oh, hey, Rhaegar. Like what you did there. Changing decadence to dragon seeds. That works. Yes, well, I am sort of known for my song lyrics, aren't I? Hey, how are you wearing the purple shades when I'm wearing the purple shades? Well, I don't know. How are you paying for the same streaming service twice every month? How am I what? That's right, Dave. I downloaded the Rocket Bunny app and... It turns out you're paying for all kinds of things you don't use. Oh no. Oh no, don't worry, Dave. Today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions, lower your monthly bills, and manage your money better. I mean, how many music streaming services do you really need to play grunge rock anthems like Hunger Strike? Oh, none, actually. I got the whole thing right here. Exactly my point. And you said the Rocket Money app will help me track my spending and bills? Ooh, can, can it help me make a budget? I've never been good at that. Well, Dave, Rocket Money makes that easy by having all those things right in one place. And they have all kinds of other tools to help you hit your budgeting and life goals, such as a smart savings account. And they can even negotiate for you to lower your monthly bills. Well, let's start by canceling some of those duplicates that you found. I wonder how long that's been going on. Well, Dave, that ends today. Take control of your finances with the Rocket Money app. I'm doing it. Uh, what about our viewers? Do we have one of those, you know, custom links that people can follow to get started with a free trial? Absolutely, absolutely. It's rocketmoney.com slash lightbringer, of course. Awesome. Well, thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring House of the Dragon content. We do appreciate it. Folks, if you want to join the more than 5 million members using Rocket Money, then simply follow the link below to get started with a free trial. And don't forget, you can unlock more features with Premium. Congratulations, you've just helped me fight YouTube censorship by watching that whole ad, thank you. So, when we're talking about ranking the dragons, it's not just about size. We also want to consider a dragon's speed, agility, ferocity, battle experience, and most importantly, the nature of their rider. Since the dragon bond does kind of seem to flow both ways, and therefore shape the personalities of both dragon and rider simultaneously. Still, size is probably the biggest factor, so here's a few facts to keep in mind about dragon size. Like snakes and reptiles, dragons have a version of what's called indeterminate growth. 
And that simply means the dragons keep getting larger forever until they die, with a couple of exceptions. One, growth is much more rapid in the juvenile phase and then slows down over time. So we've seen that dragons can be ridden after only two or three years. We saw that with Daenerys and Drogon, as well as with Dreamfire, who was ridden by Rhaena Targaryen when Dreamfire was only three. And then beyond that, dragons seem to reach, you know, a sort of medium size pretty rapidly. And then growth definitely slows down as they get older and larger. Growth depends on the availability of food. Uh, Sir Barristan said that outright to Daenerys in A Storm of Swords. We know that confined dragons grow less rapidly than ones who are free. That's something they learned about the dragon pit over time. And then finally, not all dragons grow at the same rate, just like animals and people. Uh, some people are taller. You might be taller than your brother or sister. Uh, yeah, same for dragons. So when you take all that into consideration, a 30-year-old dragon may not necessarily be much larger than, say, a 20 or even a 15-year-old dragon. And then, apart from size issues altogether, it's also important to know that dragon armor gets harder and their fires hotter with age. The vulnerable areas are the eyes, wings, and neck, so if one dragon can injure another in one of those areas, that could potentially turn a fight. Some dragons can be more ferocious or aggressive than others, and on some occasions this is noted in Fire and Blood. We know that dragons like to sneak attack and sort of dive bomb one another to gain the advantage. So just like in regular war, the element of surprise can be a deciding factor as well. Dragons fight differently on the ground than they do in the air, using their tails as whips, so be careful about approaching a grounded dragon, even if they're injured. And then finally, very mild spoiler alert, I guess, Dragon fights frequently lead to mutual annihilation. They're gigantic, terrible beasts, and once they get a hold of each other, sometimes that's it for everyone involved. So this is going to be a well-known fact to all the dragon lords involved, going back to wars in old Valyria, and therefore you can expect the dragon lords to not necessarily be super eager to throw their dragons against the other dragons as soon as they can. There may be a little more caution with that than you might expect at first. So as you can see, it is potentially possible for dragons that are lower on the ranker to upset, if you will, dragons that are higher on the ranker in a fight. And then finally, I'll just remind those of you who've read Fire and Blood that the show can and will make changes to the book. So a dragon that isn't involved in any fights in the books, you know which one I'm talking about, uh, may very well be involved in fights on the show. And the show may also play with the size and age of the dragons, which isn't always spelled out clearly anyway. All of which is to say, when I do this ranking, I really am imagining, with a clean slate, that any dragon could fight any other, not just basing this on what we know from Fire and Blood. All right, let's rank the dragons, and we're going to do this in tiers, because I listen to sports podcasts, and that's just the best format. All right, tier six. This is the close but not quite tier. So these dragons aren't considered big enough to carry a rider at the start of the war. However, they are close enough to where it could happen by the end of the war. At number 18, we have Stormcloud, the dragon of Aegon the Younger. And of course, King Aegon on Team Green would be Aegon the Elder. Aegon the Younger is the firstborn son of Daemon and Rhaenyra, and his parents, of course, both being dragon riders. We might expect him to have... Good Valerian instincts, I guess, if that's a thing. And many Targaryens do bond with dragons around age seven, so Aegon being nine is actually in the window. Fire and Blood implies that some of these kids are bonding with the dragons before they actually fly on them, so that apparently is a two-part process, for, for what it's worth. But anyways, Tyraxes is number 17, and that would be the dragon of Joffrey Valarion, who's 13, and that's Rhaenyra's third-born son, from Lainor slash Har Harwin, actually, Har uh, Lain Lainor. It's mentioned several times in Fire and Blood that Joffrey is always eager to prove himself and to join his elder brothers in the fight, so just keep your eye on that. All right, tier five, this one I called Small But Fierce, and we are now in the tier of Battle Dragons proper. Pretty much as soon as a dragon is large enough to carry a rider, it's large enough to make a difference in a battle. At this size, it's potentially the rider who's more vulnerable, as there's not a big dragon body to shield them from arrows. And we even saw Daemon taking arrows when riding Caraxes in the Stepstones. Dragons of this class can also be used for reconnaissance. Uh, they can be used to carry envoys like Jason Luke in uh, Season 1. Or they can be used to carry a young dragon lord to safety in a pinch. 
So at number 16, we have Moondancer, the mount of Bela Targaryen, age 13. And again, the show seems to have moved this along a bit so that Bela is already riding Moondancer, as we saw in the trailer. I, for one, am greatly in favor of this change, as I love Bela as a character. She's a great character, and Moondancer... One of my favorite dragons, so I'm all for it. And as to what Bela might be doing in the trailer, we can only guess, but it does look like she's just witnessed something horrible, which tends to happen around here. Sorry about that. At number 15, we have, or had, Arax. Of course, now Arax and Lucerys rest in pieces in Nana Vagar's belly, so there's that. And as we saw, this wasn't really a fight. Uh, Arax did manage a sneak attack on Vagar and went for the eyes, which is a good strategy. But Nana is basically a B-52 bomber and really was only angered by that attack. The size difference here, according to Fire and Blood, was 5 to 1 and looks to have been at least that on the show. At 14, we've got Tessarion, dragon of Daron Targaryen, Alicent and Viserys' youngest child, who is 15, at least in the books. And as I mentioned, uh, Daron and Tessarion are down in Old Town, and even if they don't appear until Season 3, you can expect them to be discussed whenever the war leaders of either side are counting up the potential dragons and dragon lords who could enter the war. So they are a factor, even if they don't appear on screen yet. But there they are. Thank you, Artis. Okay, so Vermax and Sea Smoke, I almost made a separate tier for them, but it's just really hard to tell how big either of them are compared to the other dragons in this tier. In Fire and Blood, Sea Smoke and Tessarion are judged to be the same size, and Tessarion, the fiercer, but on the show they added Sea Smoke's presence to the Stepstones War, which is a change from the books. So now he's a more experienced dragon than in the books, potentially larger and Seemingly more fierce, despite his derpy expression. Ah, that's sea smoke. Vermax is a little bit older than Rx, and therefore is potentially bigger, or even a lot bigger, we don't know. So we'll just have to wait and see Jace riding Vermax in Season 2. Now, as for Vermax's age, when we saw him in the dragon pit with a younger Prince Jaceres, he looks to maybe have been about 2 or 3. So by now, Vermax is, I would guess, about 6 or 7. Therefore, Vermax is not going to be huge, but definitely of fighting size. And we already saw at the end of last season that Jace and Vermax have been sent on a diplomatic mission that will include the Erie, White Harbor, and Winterfell. So we should definitely see some of their adventures in Season 2. Jace himself appears to be a courageous and steady lad, and he'll probably be relied upon to play an important role in the battle. So coming in at number 12 is Sea Smoke, who is about 20 to 25, actually. So I guess we can assume that he hasn't grown quite as fast as some other dragons. Or maybe Tessarion, who again is supposed to be of a similar size, is a little older than we think. That's not really said clearly how old Tessarion is either. The important thing is that show Sea Smoke is battle-tested and of decent size, as you can see. So as to Sea Smoke and Lenor's unresolved status, they basically have three choices. One of which I think is far more likely than the other two, but here they are, all three. So number one, they can say that Lenor has died in the meantime, maybe fighting in the Stepstones. Number two, they can bring Lenor back. Uh, that would definitely be a change from the books, but it could work. They'd have to change a few things, but maybe. Or three, and this is what I think they'll do, they'll simply say that there's a way for a dragon lord to release the dragon bond so that the dragon can be claimed by a different rider in the future. Or similarly, that it can simply fade with disuse over time. What we know is that in book canon, a dragon lord and a dragon bond for life, at least the life of the rider. And only after a rider's death do we ever hear about a dragon taking a new rider. However, it's not explicitly said that a dragon bond couldn't be released. It's never really addressed. And since dragons are highly intelligent beings and can sense the feelings and intentions of their riders. Yeah, I mean, maybe Lenor just threw rocks at Sea Smoke. That's the joke we've been making. Maybe he threw rocks at Sea Smoke, like Arya threw rocks at her wolf, Nymeria, until he got the message and just, you know, flew away, I guess. Well, it's actually really sad, uh... But anyway, the point is that Sea Smoke will, one way or the other, be available to be claimed by a new rider. Or, again, perhaps by Lenor coming back to ride him into the fight again, to take back Seas or something. And of course, we've seen that the trailer does seem to show us Sea Smoke and a mysterious rider meeting with Rhaenyra and Cyrax on the beach somewhere, and probably not for vacation. All right, tier four, I call this dangerous yet elusive. These dragons are formidable, but the odds of them being ridden into battle are lower. 
for one reason or another. It's kind of a weird group because Silverwing and Dreamfire are much older and larger than Grey Ghost, but you'll see it does kind of make sense. So at number 11, we have Grey Ghost. He is a wild dragon on Dragonstone, never claimed. He's the most reclusive, unclaimed dragon and avoids people entirely. He's really only ever glimpsed flying low over the waters of the Narrow Sea and Blackwater Bay, hunting fish. He can disappear into fog banks and clouds because of his coloring. So if someone could claim him, he'd be a very good sneak attack dragon. We don't know exactly how old or large Grey Ghost is, but he's definitely the smallest of the wild dragons, so presumably not super old or huge. Grey Ghost just likes to fish, man. Leave him alone. It's a simple dragon. And uh, we did see that Danny's dragons like to do that too. Uh, dive into the water, catch fish, roast them up, eat them. So this must be something that dragons do. At number 10 is Dreamfire, dragon of Helena Targaryen. Dreamfire is actually pretty old and presumably a large dragon, being 98 and having first been ridden by Reyna Targaryen. Dreamfire is kept in the dragon pit, as we've seen, so... Perhaps not as huge as she could be, as, again, dragons in confinement don't grow quite as fast or large. Dreamfire is a confirmed egg layer, and there is a theory, just a theory, that she may be the mother of Dany's dragons, the layer of Dany's dragon eggs, but do want to be clear, that's a theory, it's speculative, not a fact. So the main issue here is that Helena really just doesn't seem like the type to burn and pillage. Her reaction to the sudden violence in the throne room and her psychic sensitivity... Both make it seem like riding a dragon into war would be an unfathomably horrific experience, and one Helena may choose or not be capable of undertaking. Helena's connection to the dragons definitely revolves more around dreams and visions and prophecies as opposed to riding the dragons into war, kind of like her dad Viserys, actually. But who knows? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a switch inside Helena that can flip. And she can bring full witch queen dragon terror to the battlefield. So if she does, Dreamfire and Helena would be severely underranked on this list. So keep an eye out if uh, if that switch does flip. Number nine is Silverwing, the dragon of good queen Alisande Targaryen for some 50 years. And who has lived on Dragonstone since Alisande's death about 25 years ago. Silverwing is 93, so certainly a large and formidable dragon, but was always considered a docile dragon who was more easily approached by humans, and she's never fought in war. Silverwing does have a very interesting history, though, as she's been pretty much everywhere. She helped Alisande charm Fly Alaric Stark and famously visited the wall where Silverwing refused, or was magically barred, perhaps, from crossing the wall. Silverwing also has a thing for towers, having landed atop the high tower and breathed fire on its beacon one time when Jaehaerys and Alisande flew to Old Down for Jaehaerys' coronation. And the top of Queen's Crown is painted gold in honor of Alisande's visit there on her way to the wall. I definitely could have put Silverwing a little higher on the ranker, so be mentally prepared to move her up if and when she gains a rider. Even though she's always been docile, quote-unquote, she's still a dragon, and maybe her new rider will have a different personality than good Queen Alisanne. Tier 3, the royal dragons. These dragons are ridden by our rival monarchs. In a way, these are the most important dragons, because should either monarch take their mount into battle, they risk losing the entire war for their side if they are slain. Rhaenyra and Aegon may have little choice, however, since there really are only so many battle dragons available. These both seem to be medium-sized dragons. Even though Cyrax is a bit older, Sunfire is described as a fast-growing and large dragon for his age. So I've ranked Sunfire 8th here. Sunfire is approximately the same age as King Aegon, it seems, or maybe a little bit younger, so 17 to 23, about. Sunfire is, of course, said to be the most beautiful dragon who ever lived, as you can see from all the wonderful fan art. Shout-out to our artists, who are always credited below the art, of course. Folks, if you're sharing art, on the internet, make sure you share the name of the artist, and of course, there will never be any AI art on this channel. You can rest assured of that. But moving right along, Sunfire, the most beautiful dragon, also extremely ferocious, potentially like his rider. And what I mean by that is that even though Aegon did try to run from the responsibility of kingship, now that he's embracing it, we should see his more aggressive traits and repressed anger rise to the surface, I would expect. I did, of course, discuss Aegon in a lot more detail in our Season 2 Aegon character preview video, so check that out. But yeah, he's young and impulsive, entitled and at times abusive. Yeah, abusive, and he's 
the R word, he, he committed the R word, let's say it, but not actually say it because of the YouTube censors, but you you know what I mean? He's also got a drinking problem and probably quite a lot of repressed anger from all the trauma and abuse he suffered at the hands of his mother, Alicent, and his grandfather, Otto. So it's less a question of, is Aegon willing to use his dragon? And a lot more of a question of, how long can Otto prevent him from doing that? Otto Hightower does like to try to keep young dragon lords on a leash, but as we've seen, he's not very good at it. And then number seven is Cyrax. Cyrax wins. Never gonna stop saying that. Queen Rhaenyra's dragon. I was ready to say Cyrax, and then the show went Cyrax, and now I'm all confused. I played a lot of Mortal Kombat. Anyway, Cyrax is Rhaenyra's dragon, a confirmed egg layer as well, like Dreamfire. Cyrax is a little older than Sunfire by a few years, but maybe of similar size. And they look to be of the same dragon body type as well. Now, Fire and Blood does portray Rhaenyra as being reluctant to fly into battle, being traumatized by the death of Lucerys and her recent miscarriage. However, some of that may be sexism and bias on the part of the maesters, it must be said, because, as we've mentioned, both monarchs really should be mindful of the fact that if they die in battle, their cause is lost. And it's actually Daemon who at first is reluctant to pit the Team Black Dragons directly against the Team Green Dragons, not Rhaenyra. The show also invented the scenes with Rhaenyra flying Cyrax to Dragonstone to intervene in between Daemon and Otto. So it's possible show Rhaenyra is just a bolder character and won't be as reluctant to fly her dragon into battle. Overall, Sunfire and Cyrax are pretty comparable, but I'd say the edge goes to Rhaenyra for sake of her having more experience with her dragon. All right, tier two, whole lot of nasty, the nasty class of dragon. Nothing you want to tangle with, folks. These dragons can potentially make short work of dragons that are smaller than them and can even potentially pull off an upset against the largest class of dragons simply because they've grown large enough themselves to do real damage to even a monster like Vagar or Beleriand the Black Dread. At number six, we have the Wild Sheep Stealer an unclaimed dragon on Dragonstone. And again, I was kind of shocked to learn that Sheep Stealer is actually pretty damn old and therefore pretty damn huge. Sheep Stealer was actually born when Jaehaerys was young. So this is another century old dragon here. And that means that Sheep Stealer is potentially larger than even Melis or Caraxes, And certainly of a similar size at the very least. It all depends on how good the sheep eating is around the Narrow Sea, I suppose. And I'm guessing it's pretty good if you're a dragon. So sheep stealers thing, of course, is to hunt sheep. It's, it's the humans who call it stealing. I mean, what is stealing to a dragon? What are the laws of men to a dragon? However, sheep stealer is conscientious and apparently does not eat the shepherds. Occasionally the sheep dogs, never the shepherds, lots of sheep. Sheep stealer is nasty when cornered, however, so let's keep that in mind. Apparently the dragon keepers were never able to tame her when she was young, and then she turned wild and has been wild on Dragonstone for about 70 years now. So it's likely that no shepherds have died because they probably don't come anywhere near the anywhere near sheep stealer. They probably just let, let the dragon have the sheep. That's what I would do. Number five, Melis, the Red Queen, Dragon of Rainies Targaryen. Melis is about 60 to 65 and was previously written by Alyssa Targaryen, who was the mother of King Viserys. Alyssa famously, this is one of the coolest dragon tidbits to know, Alyssa took both baby Viserys and his older brother Balin on Dragonback, on Melis, to, uh, to have a dragon flight when they were only two weeks old. Now we've seen that Rhaenys has very tight control of Melis, being able to keep a tight rein on her even in a huge crowd of tasty humans, which may stand in contrast to the way that Aemond and Lucerys seemed to be unable to control their dragons last season. Melis is noted as being clearly the fastest dragon alive, by a good bit apparently. So she really is ideal for patrolling the narrow sea as she's been charged with doom. She can cover a lot of ground in a hurry, in other words. Melis is certainly terrifying and huge. You can ask Alicent and the rest of Team Green about that. And of course, Melis is extremely good at smashing ceilings with her head. All right, number four, everyone's favorite spicy noodle monster, 
The real nickname is Caraxes, the blood worm, of course. Caraxes is a bit younger than Melis at 50 to 55, but I've ranked Caraxes higher simply for sake of being the most battle-tested and tricksy dragon, and also having Daemon as a rider. Caraxes was said to be the nastiest dragon in the pit when Aemon Targaryen first claimed him, and Aemon is Rhaenys' father, by the way. Most importantly, Caraxes has fought in several wars, the Fourth Dornish War in 83, the Mirish invasion of Tarth in 92, and then the Stepstones War with Daemon, uh, which was 106 to 115, and of course, we saw that in Season 1. <music> Tier 1, which I've called the Godzilla class, and there's really no surprises here, with Vagar being number 1, but she's not the only unfathomably huge dragon around. So at number three, we have the Cannibal, who is a wild, riderless dragon on Dragonstone. As I mentioned, the biggest of the three wild dragons. Cannibal is named for his habit of descending on the Dragonstone hatcheries to eat the baby dragons and the young dragons and the dragon eggs. Chomp, chomp, pachui, chomp. He chomps them all. And the interesting thing about Cannibal, again, is that he may predate the Targaryen arrival on Dragonstone, which occurred in 112 BC. And if that's the case... Cannibal may be over 230 years old. Now, there were Valerians on Dragonstone before the Targaryens immigrated there. So Cannibal could date to that time and to those Valerians, or it could just be a wild dragon. Wild dragons do exist in the world. But if Cannibal is from a different Valerian lineage other than Targaryen, that could explain why he's so eager to kill off all the Targaryen dragons, right? Perhaps he's following some instinct to essentially eliminate his rivals. Although he might want to mate with one first, unless he knows how to lay eggs by himself, um, which could be a thing. we I'll make a video about that. But in any case, the longer a dragon is unclaimed, the harder it is to claim them. So really would take a miracle to claim the cannibal. And the dragon keepers on Dragonstone have tried. They've made a dozen attempts, apparently, and his cave is littered with their bones. At number two is Vermithor, the Bronze Fury, and if Vagar is Nana, this may be Grandpa. I still know how to carry a tune and gut a rug, and don't you whippersnappers forget it. Vermithor was, of course, excuse me, uh, the mount of King Jaehaerys Targaryen, and Vermithor was hatched in 34 AC, was already large by 48 AC, and is now almost 100. If a rider can be found, Watch out, and now you can sort of see why Damon was interested in priming Vermithor to be bonded with again, as I believe he was doing in that scene where he sang to old Vermi. That's how you keep the dragons friendly, after all. You sing them their favorite old classic hits from Valeria. In case you missed it, I did make a video in season one analyzing Damon's song that he was singing to Grandpappy Vermithor, which actually, I believe, has something to do with the origin and nature of the dragon bond, so check that one out. It's called Damon's Song. And number one, of course, is Vagar. That's Nana. Put some respect on her name. It's not polite to talk about her age, exactly, but it's, it's closer to two centuries than one. It's 180. Vagar has carried on her back such Targaryens as Visenya the Conqueror, Balon the Brave, Lena Valarion, and now Aemond One-Eye the Kinslayer. She's twice as big as Caraxes, according to Fire and Blood, and that looks to be about the same on the show, I'd say. vagar has been in too many wars to count. That's why they all kind of run together for her, you understand? And what she knows is destruction. And of course, if you want a detailed accounting of all of Vagar's destruction, including a spoilery preview of what Aemond did with Vagar in Fire and Blood, then check out the video, Vagar, Queen of Destruction. Bottom line, Vagar and Aemon equals very bad news for Team Black, and they pretty much have to be constantly planned around. Looking back over this ranker, you can really see that Team Green would have had no shot in this, but for the fact of Aemon having claimed Vagar on that fateful night after Lena's funeral. And you better believe Aemon knew what he was doing when he did that. He's been seeing this war coming for a long time, in my opinion, and I think that's why he told his mother not to worry about his eye and counted it well worth the acquisition of mighty Vagar. So basically, if this was a game of chess, Vagar is kind of like the only queen on the board, at least right now. She shapes the entire game. So there you go, folks. There's the dragon ranker, of course. Leave me your comments. Let me know where you disagree, where you, what changes you would make, and we'll see what happens on House of the Dragon. Like I said, it could be different from Fire and Blood, so don't think that you know. Don't think that you know just because you've read the books. But what we do know is that it, it will be carnage full and bloody, so... 
prepare. Some some of the dragons are gonna die. That's that's not even a spoiler. It's, they're not all gonna live. That's what this story is about. It's how the Targaryens lost a lot of their dragons fighting a civil war. So that's gonna start with this season. And I'll be there with you. Me and Grey Waste Tim and maybe a couple other people to comfort you after each horrific event every single week. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you very soon with another House of the Dragon video. And you can find all of our House of the Dragon videos in our House of the Dragon playlist, which is linked below and also appearing on the screen right now next to my face.